Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome on behalf of the Learning and Development Working Group of the Alliance for Child Protection and Humanitarian Action to the Adapting Case Management in the Context of COVID-19 One Year On webinar. We are looking forward to our time together today. My name is Michelle Van Aken, and I work in Plan International USA. I will be your moderator during this webinar, which will be taking the form of a panel discussion. Uh, with funding from USAID's Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance, PLAN is supporting the LD Working Group in developing capacity building resources for child protection actors to support adapting to COVID-19 realities. At the onset of the pandemic, a primary concern for child protection practitioners globally was how to continue life-saving child protection case management services during lockdowns and quarantines. Case management teams were faced with the challenge of shifting to remote modalities for a service that relies heavily on being able to interact in person in order to build trust and rapport with children and their caregivers. How can we maintain the same level of support when relying on a phone call? Um, would we still be able to communicate with our existing cases and identify and register new cases? Over a year later, the Learning and Development Working Group, working with the Case Management Task Force, has put together a panel of case management specialists to share learning challenges and adaptations um, in advance of a release of new capacity building resources. Um, with that, I would like to introduce our four panelists that we have with us today. Um, we will be hearing from Ibrahim Othman, uh, Child Protection Manager uh, from IRC, um, Madhumita, uh, who is a child protection manager with Save the Children India, Sarah Barabar, uh, case management program coordinator with Save the Children Lebanon, Sorna Chakma, case management coordinator with Terry Zone in Bangladesh. And then following the panel discussion, uh, Elena will be sharing new resources developed by the LD Working Group with funding from BHA. Um, so with that, uh, I'd like to um, welcome our panelists. Thank you for joining us all today. Um, we can kick it off with a question for all of our panelists. Um, what were the main adaptations made to case management programming in your context during COVID-19? Um, Farah, I'd like to invite you to respond first. So mainly for, for COVID in Lebanon, for Lebanon context, and since the Save the Children in Lebanon is a colleague on the National Case Management Task Force with IRC, there was a lot of focus on developing a set and various guidance on uh, guidance for remote case management interventions and the criteria to take taking into consideration the current situation and environment, the household settings, and other relevant factors, including the child's resiliency, vulnerabilities, and other supporting factors we have. And also since SAVE is a core member of the working group, we were coordinating closely with other agencies for that matter to ensure that input from everyone was being taken into consideration. Uh, we managed to finalize the, the guidance in less than a month after the lockdown measures were implemented by the government. So there was a swift response for that matter for, within Lebanon. And this helped guide the, the way for, for the field staff and for people on the field to, to ensure there's a proper response to what we're encountering. Another main adaptation was we have our alternative care team. Our alternative care team usually has a pool of host families to, to attend and to support children who are separated and unaccompanied. So with COVID, we are expecting to have, for example, children have been separated from their caregivers because of the COVID and without an alternative uh, household or caretakers. One of the challenges was the pool of host families that usually attend to the children with protection concerns. We faced some challenges, so instead we shifted to caretakers who, who are safe individuals from the community. I would support in terms of the psychosocial and the monetary support to the caretakers. SAVE was also supporting other agencies who took this initiative as well in terms of training and monitoring on how these measures were being adopted. During March 2020, the lockdown measures were implemented in the country. After like early 2021, January 2021, we did an anonymous survey and uh, an assessment with 15 with different local and international agencies to build on our best practices and uh, lessons learned on how we can adapt the, the guidance that were already developed at the time. 
Uh, and a lot of focus was also on the data protection and security procedures during remote work that was done in terms of how to safely work with the, with the children and how to collect the data in a safe manner. So these are briefly the one of some of the key points that we attended to. Thank you, Farah. And Swarna, could you tell us a bit about what were the main adaptations that TDH made in Bangladesh? Okay, thank you, everyone. So uh, during this uh, design and implementation of the remote TDS case management, TDS basically focused on like how TDS case workers and community volunteers uh, should provide remote support to the child and to their uh, families, existing their case loads like medium or high risk cases. And we ensure that community volunteers or case workers, their phones are available at all times and fully charged and ensure that child and family have relevant numbers to contact um, in case of any emergency to their community volunteers. And also uh, for the data protection, if the case workers uh, fill out any forms uh, during the conversation, so, uh, so we ensure that uh, the safe storage of any identifiable information. In such cases, CDS keep uh, information as a safe place uh, to maintaining a standard procedure um, and in cost budget context, we are using the CTMS Plus software to input our uh, data. Thank you so much, Lorna. Um, this has been a trend that we've seen uh, an increased reliance on community volunteers and it's exciting to hear that TDH was also, um, while relying on community volunteers, also increasing coaching and supervision. Um, Ibrahim, can you tell us a bit about how IRC adapted case management? Okay, thank you, Michael. In terms of adoption, we have developed a training uh, to case worker. Uh, we have used some uh, sources uh, supported by the technical unit. So the first thing that we did is to reassessment uh, all cases, including the previous cases. So as a result of COVID-19, we identified some new cases being identified, as well as some closed cases uh, uh, being uh, identified as reopened, uh, and also some uh, cases has been like classified from uh, low cases to the high because of the impact of COVID-19. Uh, so we also uh, ensure to train uh, the CB staff members of COVID-19 uh, about the prevention and what the symptoms so they can provide uh, the community. Uh, as well as we train our child protection committee on that symptoms to start like awareness session throughout the community. Regarding the practice, uh, first thing that we have uh, always uh, should include is we always check with the families if there is anyone, uh, for example, that been, uh, has any type of symptoms of COVID-19. So we provide the guidelines and how they can reach the hospital. We have also uh, trained our PSS team uh, on uh, case management, so they can support the remotely case management uh, for the low cases, uh, while high and medium is uh, followed by uh, the case worker. So we have also managed low cases remotely via phone uh, and all, only conduct uh, home visits for high cases when it's needed. Uh, while there is some kind of medium or low cases that might need like home visit, but we always ensure that it's safety and dignity. Great, thank you. Those adaptations are quite interesting. Um, and then, Madhumita, could you tell us a bit about how Save the Children adapted case management in India? So in terms of talking about major adaptations, we also started uh, in terms of uh, how we can do remote case management. So we visited our uh, case management SOP to see what are the things that uh, can be done remotely and what are the things that need to be you know curtailed in terms of uh, since uh, mobility was restricted it won't be possible to interact with children maybe as it would have been done and uh, you know in the normal time uh, so we revisited our sop in terms of uh, integrating it in with telecalling the main means to conduct remote case management we develop uh, uh, new telecalling norms and communication principles and maintaining confidentiality how this could be conducted and uh, we also uh, 
in terms of uh, remote case management we also see how the uh, case worker uh, would be maintaining their uh, repo with the other stakeholders also so the main focus was on to maintain relationship with the children and the caregivers who were already enrolled in our case management system and so they should be maintaining that repo and also with the you know stakeholders who were involved in the process of case planning and implementation it was decided that uh, during this uh, you know, lockdown period no case would would be closed during this period until and unless we have uh, an opportunity to interact with the children and the other who all were associated in implementing the case management plan uh and also we saw a renewed focus uh, we focused on pss uh, in terms of providing psychosocial support and and it was uh, more towards you know uh, focusing more towards preventing on the prevention approach so the, the case workers were provided with uh, tips to share with caregivers and also children to how they can maintain a positive environment within their uh, own household so that children are not pushed into a kind of uh, you know uh, stress and and how to keep the caregiver themselves also uh, distressed uh the second adaptation uh, i would say was uh, a series of training to build our capacity of our case workers uh, to help them you know conduct uh, remote case management and it started with helping them to acquaint with the uh, new you know online method using mobile phone to using whatsapp using the zoom and the refresher training was provided on psychosocial support because that was a need of the hour and it was provided to them another adaptation i would say uh, that was brought in was in the role of the case worker the case workers has been closely working with the local child protection mechanism um with the community level uh, mechanism the, the local bodies the administrative bodies which are there so the case workers were looked upon as an additional resources in terms of providing information on child protection and vulnerable households in the community so there was a, a change in the role of community caregivers also they were also included in the in the uh, covid response and distribution uh, team which were constituted locally and they were asked for support in terms of identifying vulnerable children and help them with uh, distribution also when mobility was little bit relaxed another role which our case workers has done marvelously was uh, when they were doing case management they were basically involving with children one to one but during this covid time they reached out to our children groups so and the children group has been a marvelous example because the community caregiver was using this time to oh, communicate with them on the risk communication in terms of covid related appropriate behavior are uh, spreading messages on child protection systems and uh, you know mechanism available like familiarizing with the helpline number and it has really helped us in terms of uh, reporting of high risk cases as during the lockdown period so many of the high risk cases which was reported during that time on child marriage uh, related to sexual abuse it was uh, was uh, reported to our community cadder uh, that's what we call the, the case workers in india uh, uh, so they it was reported by children to them and then the our case workers could take it up appropriately with the local child protection mechanism uh another adaptation in terms of us uh, uh, running the case management efficiently we thought it was important and to help our own case workers and you know, how we should be keep their motivation up and how we should be encouraging them so we try to increase the frequency of interacting with our our community cadder in a systematic manner and encourage them to use the pfa tools to do self assessment and assess their stress level and so the community case, the case workers they were they, they distressed so there was also then the role sharing among the case workers someone could take the additional responsibility till the other was stressed because they were also handling covid infected um, family members also and the first wave uh, it was really really difficult for them also to cope with the situation and more so because 
they were not used to this remote case management in terms of using the mobile phone on for most of our case workers health mobile is and uh, is an a necessity so it was uh, very difficult for them also uh, other adaptation in terms of forms and formats and some of the tools which we were using where we try to revisit to capture the information and because uh, most of the uh, formats were developed on the basis of one to one interaction when we talk to the children and when you talk to the caregivers and the other stakeholders so it was uh, quite a bit of challenging to relook into this so that the information could be captured adequately in terms of time also that was also very very crucial in terms of when we should talk to the children whether the child have an access to the mobile phone whether the child had the access to a safe space so those were the some of the things uh, which had to be really really uh, contextualized and we need to be integrated into our various tools of case management and i hope during the course of discussion i will get some time to share some of the good practices we'll definitely be able to get to those good practices and thank you for um, for sharing some of those adaptations it seems like across all of um, your responses that really you know having to reconsider how we handle confidentiality um, increasing reliance on community volunteers and community groups um, adapting to how can we do case management which is such a a face-to-face -face interactive service um, and how can we do that into the same quality over the phone. I, I think these are were all some of the questions that we are all grappling with. So it's really interesting to hear how each of you and your teams adapted. Um, so now thinking about, you know, with these adaptations, um, my next question, and, and I'll ask Farah first, um, is what did you have to reconsider during the year? What were some adaptations you've made that you maybe had to rethink or reconfigure? So I think a lot of points were already covered by my colleagues as well. It was much more difficult for us to, to, to identify children, especially since most activities were being conducted remotely. We were not able to do outreach activities, for example, or classes and schools are all put on hold. And another thing in Lebanon, along with the COVID situation we were facing, we had another emergency, which was the, the Beirut blast, which happened on the 4th of August in 2020. And on top of that, we also, which is still ongoing, the economic crisis of Lebanon. And for my colleagues from all over the place, I would definitely recommend to read more about this. When, when three different emergencies and crises were happening in parallel, it was much more difficult and a lot of focus needed to take place on the mental health services. This is one of the main gaps we face in Lebanon, to be honest, in terms of service providers available. But fortunately, for example, for Save the Children in Lebanon, there's much more focus that's taking place on that. Uh, another thing that we had to focus much more on was the safety and well-being of the staff. Of the staff. And, uh, so we needed to focus more on that. And currently, we're still focusing and prioritizing this as well as we go on. Uh, and another thing which was a challenge, and I would love to hear from colleagues from other countries as well how they dealt with this, was how to ensure appropriate inclusion of children with impairments, especially with remote follow-up and remote support. Uh, but again, it's worth noting that, for example, in Lebanon, case management was considered as a life-saving activity. So we increased our coordination and we increased our coordination among sectors, especially with the, with the local authorities. This made it easier for us to intervene and support, especially when the, when the whole country was, was in lockdown. Uh, and one thing that I think was one of the best practices was the amendment of how the safety and action plans were conducted with the children remotely. Uh, safety plans, for example, had to be revisited for all cases. For example, we had medium risk cases that became low, while others low risk cases became medium and high. So the safety and the action plans were amended, and this is where the creativity of the staff and the teams had played a big role in, in making this successful. For example, through video calls with the children or drawings, and they would, and when when the caseworker would meet with the family face to face, this would be put into words to ensure the child participation is taking is taken into consideration, and to make sure that to keep them interested and to to make sure that the knowledge that we are trying to share is transferred appropriately, both ways, it's two ways, and from the children to our end and from our end to the children. 
And one, one thing that I think really facilitated our work was we, we started preparing case management kits, which would include materials and recreational materials, which facilitated the remote follow-up. It built the trust faster with the children and it helped them, for example, to incorporate the action plans through their activities properly while working on the distress of the children and in parallel supporting the caregivers in that matter as well. Thank you, Farah. And then, um, Marunita, could you also share with us what were some of the adaptations or some of the case management modalities that you had to reconsider during this past year? Uh, so again, yeah, one of the major course correction or the way was, you know, in terms of uh, the looking in assessing the cases, because what happened was, as Farah just shared, it, the same which was happening in India also, because with widespread reporting of rise in the increase of domestic violence and the instances of child marriage and elopement, we focused on doing the case risk assessment quite frequently. During this context, when we found that an increasing of our violence and child marriages uh, instances, so we uh, um, emphasized on frequently doing the case review in terms of assessing their risk level. So that was one thing which was quite challenging. And this is something we took it up as a uh, mid-course uh, correction with, based on our learnings. We had to emphasize on uh, the community workers supporting the local administration. And then we had to be looking to their a load of cases and to some extent how it could be shared within the team. There was also reverse migration, which was happening at the, at the same time. I mean, the government had set up the quarantine centers and there were some norms and guidelines also, but it was very difficult to, to keep a supervision and monitor those, uh, whether those are being statutory norms have been followed or not. So we had to deploy some of our community cadres uh, with the local administration to help them supervise those quarantine centers and to see the norms are being followed. And also the utmost need that we felt was revisiting into our vulnerability criteria and the criteria which were used to uh, you know, do the risk assessment because of all the situations. So this is the process which we are still working on in terms of finalizing the what kind of vulnerabilities need to be added into our, our list. These are the, some of the things I think uh, no, which we had to reconsider the mid course. Yeah. Thank you, Marumita. Um, I think that's very interesting that you had to reconsider the vulnerability criteria. Um, I find that to be a, a really interesting point. So thank you for sharing about that. Um, our next question for the panelists is about what worked well in your context. And do you think this will have an impact on how we will implement case management in the future? So what worked well, and is this going to change case management even after the pandemic? Um, Ibrahim, I'd like to ask you to share your thoughts first. Uh, we consider the uncombined children and separate children to ensure uh, there is always an uh, alternative foster family in case one of the caregiver uh, being isolated at the hospital. So at least to include that uh, in the uh, case plan to be like preparation plan for the ch that child. Uh, in case there is like uh, symptoms of COVID-19. Uh, we have also uh, reached most of the households conducting the awareness session of COVID-19 and distribute some hygiene kits, including uh, some uh, uh, <coughs> materials that can protect them with some advices uh, to ensure that uh, they understand the disease and they know the, how they can prevent that. So regarding the classification of the children, we understand that they will be in fact uh, with the three scenarios that we have done. So we started to like uh, coordinate with other NGOs in case that they can come to support in the field. So also our uh, last point that uh, we did the child monitoring activities. Actually it was like a monthly basis, but uh, due to the COVID-19, uh, we have received some tools uh, from technical units that help us to identify the, those children uh, who have been as a result of uh, COVID-19 that help us to address our child uh, concern and how to respond. This will be impact on how we will implement the case management in the future. Uh, we need to have like uh, some kind of uh, active uh, monitoring uh, for the cases so we can understand the situation and the trend so we can have that plan. Thank you, Ibrahim. That's very interesting. Thank you. And then I think our last question for the panelists um, that we'd like to hear from all of you is, what do you wish you had known a year ago 
or if you could travel back in time and visit yourself a year ago, what would you tell yourself? What advice would you give yourself? Um, Madhumita, I'll ask you to, to begin. So one thing would be definitely like when we developed our case management, it was basically really based on the normal situation. So that was one thing that we often feel that uh, the, the case management should also figure, you know, any emergency like situation or any disaster like situation. So that is something that if we had considered it during in our SOP and we do consultation, if we had had also helped the local you know, the systems also to have some kind of mechanism um, to follow on when you have such kind of uh, you know, restricted services. Often in the community, there are some hard to reach areas which we do not focus on that much. What should be the mechanism um, to reach out to places where there would be you know, my accessibility in terms of mobile phone to at least find out how the children and are faring in this kind of situation and what kind of support would they would be looking for. Uh, another uh, thing is that we are also looking into how we can integrate if this entire case management uh, programming in, into other existing child protection interventions in terms of maybe child labor where we are working into how to you know pull out children from the labor situation and put them into the you know mainstream into schools and normal thing and similarly when you have intervention on child marriages how do we integrate the case management into those programming so those are the key thing for me Thank you, Madhumita. Um, that's very, I think that's very good advice for, for former us. Um, Swarna, could you tell me what do you wish you'd known a year ago or what advice you'd give to yourself if you could travel back in time? Uh, okay, thank you, Michelle. Under the uh, lockdown, caring for the staff and priority prioritizing their well-being and their resilience was not prioritized. So it could be like I mean, uh, creating a space to ask that stuff about their concerns and their needs and uh, their ideas for moving forward. And also sharing resources for managing uh, stress and uh, maintaining emotional, I mean, well-being. Another point is like uh, checking in regularly as a form of uh, emotional support. So. A year ago that we did not really understand the, the importance of that stuff well being. So I wish we all knew that how to better support uh, our staff from the very beginning in a very uh, comprehensive way. So another point is specific circumstances we covenant. We are not working with only child, work, we are working with the caregiver also. So caregivers also can be very overwhelmed. So for the best um, interest of the child and the family, we also support to the child, I mean, as well as the caregiver also. Thank you so much, Sorna. I think that's, you know, really the, been a key lesson learned is that we had no idea how COVID-19 and the compounding crises that resulted from COVID-19 would impact, you know, not just the, the communities we work with, but also ourselves and the teams that we work with. And I think a good reminder for us would be to just be kind and to yeah. make sure you're emphasizing that. So I think that's a really great point. Ibrahim, what would you tell yourself? What would you tell February 2020 you? Okay, uh, so I think for case management, uh, as as we all aware that there is a huge challenge, I would love that we just, if you could be better uh, prepared to respond to remotely case management. So now, for example, now we have children that, that's right, we communicate with them, with the parents, uh, the child for sure, he will not have the cell phone, but we keep communicating with the parent and say, everything is fine. So we talk to the child and he say, yes, everything is fine. So, but we are not sure if it's fine really or not, especially for sensitive cases. So it's, uh, it's not easy, but sometimes uh, we need to adapt that. Thank you. Yes, I think a uh, really key lesson learned is that it's very hard to determine how somebody actually is when you're trying to speak with them over the phone and to make sure that we really are just providing that support and making sure that you know we're creating as safe an environment as we can. Um, and Farah, um, what would you tell yourself um, in February 2020 if you could? A lot of preparedness, a lot of planning that have supported so many things in advance. 
the, the importance of putting well-being and self-care staff plans in advance would have supported a lot as well, as this would have been activated timely when needed immediately on the spot. Uh, we need definitely the importance of preparedness plans to focus more on concrete case management, child protection, and mental health PSS as well, while also mainstreaming across other sectors, including livelihood, basic assistance, health education. This, this definitely, I think, would have helped us across a path way faster than we wanted. If we knew it was COVID and we're shifting to remote, then just always working on having an emergency preparedness plan for different, different scenarios at hand. Focus on awareness and mainstreaming of technology among the communities, among the individuals, and the safe use of technology for children. I think this would have also made our intervention faster and easier. Uh, and definitely having the resources at hand, having the needed basic supplies in terms of food and basic needs, in terms of the hygiene kits, in terms of the health, health resources needed. This would have been very helpful. And this will also vary from one context to another. But for Lebanon, this is something we wish we, we knew in advance to be able to prepare the staff with the resources needed and the communities with the resources needed. Thank you, Farah. I think those are really good points. And I mean, as they say, hindsight is twenty twenty. And I think a very key lesson is how can we be better prepared for similar crises in the future? Um, so I think that's a really excellent point. I think definitely something we're all asking ourselves that we how we can be better prepared for the future. So I think those are really some wonderful lessons learned. Um, I want to thank all of our panelists for these wonderful insights and for sharing your experiences. But with that, I'd like to hand things over to Elena, um, the co-lead of the l and Working Group, to announce some new resources that will help with some of these challenges that were raised. Thanks, Michelle, and thanks, Kira, for pulling the slides up, much appreciated. And thanks first and foremost to all of the panelists. You don't realize, I think, like the contribution you have made like to the conversation on case management. So great to hear all of your experiences. I've seen a lot of the comments in the chat were really positive and showed a sincere interest for the adaptations you have all made to the learning and development working group and case management task force that we've done with the development of two models. There is one first learning model, which is case management delivered by a phone, and it's a specifically targeting frontline case workers, social workers, and their supervisors, potentially. The aim of these models is to prepare workers to safely deliver case management services via phone in the context of COVID-19 or possibly other infectious diseases outbreaks that transmit in the same manner as COVID-19. The learning model is designed to include 30 minutes pre-training assignment, and it can be delivered both face-to-face -face or remotely. Via face to face, it will take approximately two days, uh, while remotely, it uh, will entail one preparatory live session and then three additional live sessions, which vary a little bit in length. But uh, yeah, between three and four hours max. Uh, and then there are two additional coaching sessions at the end to the learning model. The, the model, it's, it's, it's in its finalization stages, which means that it's currently being graphically edited and translated into Spanish, Arabic, and French. We will be, of course, posting it on the Alliance website as soon as we have it uh, in its most finalized layout. The second model which we have developed is uh, on transitioning to remote case management more broadly. So this, uh, um, this learning model is actually aimed at managers, coordinators, basically for part practitioners that are in charge of managing and coordinating case management service delivery. And it aims at basically better prepare colleagues to transition to remote case management, making sure you have like all the key considerations at end. 
This one, it's taught to be delivered both face-to-face -face or remotely. Uh, so face-to-face -face will take approximately one day and a half and remotely facilitated about three live sessions, plus an optional follow-up and some pre-work to do. It's available if you would like to um, request it uh, from us, and it's currently being translated again in French, Spanish, and Arabic. And I just would like to extend my thank you to all of the colleagues that have worked like, on these modules as well, because some may not be present today, but it has uh, been a really enriching experience to work with the world group and to also think of this webinar together. So yeah, thanks a lot. And back to Michelle for final remarks. So before ending our session today, I'd like to thank everyone um, who is attending over Zoom or listening in over the live Facebook stream. We would also like to thank all the panelists for joining us today and Elena for um, sharing these new resources, as well as the Alliance and BHA. Thank you all again for attending and from all of us at the Alliance, thank you and goodbye.